So glad to see everyone. And you know the routine. I, we would like to have someone present a case uh, this morning. And we would like to uh, have two discussants, ideally one identifying as a woman and one identifying as a man. So do we have a case and do we have two discussants? Do we have a case and do we have two discussants? I actually don't have a 10 a.m. Pacific time meeting today, but that seems to be an effective trick to get people to start earlier so I can pretend I have a meeting at 10 a.m. Will that bring anyone to uh, volunteer? I have a case I can bring up. Um, sorry, it's my first time joining here. Um, oh, fantastic. You have a neurology case? Um, sort of. Uh, I, I work in the ICU here in Texas, and uh, we have a patient um, in his 40s diagnosed with COVID uh, pneumonia. Uh, came in with hypoxemic respiratory failure. His hypoxia is largely resolved. However, um, for the past two days, um, he's been completely off sedation and he's developed um, a decorticate posturing in his upper extremities, lack of withdrawal in the lower, and he's having um, hippus rhythmic eye movements. And we haven't been able to nail the diagnosis or understand what's going on. Um, he had a head CT done and it, it was difficult to obtain how, how however, um, um, there was some motion artifact, which- So I'm gonna, uh, I'm gonna pause you there. I'm sorry, this sounds like a fascinating um, case to discuss, um, but usually the way we do things is we, um, we have sure. cases where we do know the um, final diagnosis Got it. Um, so that for the learners, there's sort of a conclusion um, at the Fair end. Enough. It sounds like a fascinating case. And before you told me the CT and the findings, in case you do make a diagnosis, maybe it's a case to bring back um, Certainly. Certainly. Since neurologic complications. Sorry to interrupt you, but... Um, no, no, no. That's perfectly fine. Thank yeah. you. No, thank you for um, bringing the case. And I'm um, definitely... It would be interesting to talk about neurologic complications of COVID just for many of our learners, our uh, students who are early um, residents. So the case can be complicated and it sounds definitely like a complicated case evaluating a comatose um, patient. Um, but we like to sort of have in general when we can closure so that um, students see if our reasoning all along um, has sort of its um, uh, appropriate uh, conclusion or if not, we, we learn from that. So thank you. Um, Ghazi for bringing um, that case. And um, if you have uh, some follow-up, then maybe we can, you'll see how we do things today and um, can present it in the future. Certainly. Appreciate it. Thank you very much. Um, so we have Gabrielle uh, volunteering. Fantastic. Okay. So we, we do have a backup case since no one has a, um, a case and you'll get to see um, Ghazi. Thank you again very much. Um, Gabriella, how sort of how we, um, present um, these cases in this format. I'd love to discuss your case uh, in, the, in the future. So um, great, we have Gabriella is going to present the case. We have Gabrielle who's going to uh, um, present. And is it Gabrielle's birthday? Wow, that is a wonderful way to celebrate your birthday, discussing a neurology case. I love it. Um, who would like to discuss with Gabrielle, ideally um, someone identifying as a woman, if um, possible? And it's Vale's birthday too. Fantastic. What a birthday celebration. Look at these two de dedicated neuro VMR uh, participants, discussants. Um, anyone like to discuss the case um, with, with Gabriel today? Ideally, someone identifying as a, as a woman. Um, I would like to discuss if no one else wants to. Fantastic. It's your birthday. We're having a birthday uh, extravaganza at neuro. Um, VMR, fantastic. So um, Gabrielle and Valeria, um, and uh, Gabrielle, do you wanna briefly introduce yourselves? And Maria, will you be able to um, fly back and forth between scribing and teaching points? Um, fantastic. So yeah, introduce yourselves briefly and we will get um, running. And uh, my apologies again, um, Gazi, for not um, hearing your full case today, but hopefully uh, in the future. 
Hi everyone, my name is Gabriel. I'm 22 years old today with Vale. I'm very excited to be here today. What a nice way to spend my birthday. I actually have to admit I have a lot of neurophobia. I find it hard, but it's very interesting for me. And thank you so much, Aaron. I, I have learned a lot during this process on the VMRs. Fantastic. Well, thank you for volunteering on your um, birthday. Happy birthday. And um, thank you for admitting your neurophobia. That's why we're here to discuss neurology cases and hopefully in that process diminish um, neurophobia. Um, and Valeria, Gabriela. Uh, yes, I'm Vale, I'm from Lima, Peru as well, and I am Gabriel's uh, twin, <laughs> kind of. And um, yeah, I'm ready today too, and I really couldn't imagine a better, a better way than to discuss a neurovmr case. And so super excited for the case, Gabby. Fantastic. Thank you, Valeria. Happy birthday. And Gabriela, is it your birthday too? If not, just say it's your birthday. I'll say it's my birthday and we'll, we'll all have, um, <laughs> we'll have whatever neurology horoscope um, zodiac sign is, is today. <laughs> Hi, everyone. So I was going to start saying I'm Gabriela and it's on my birthday today, but you said it first. <laughs> so yeah, I'm very excited to share this case with you and I hope we can learn a lot. And I'm from Brazil. <laughs> Fantastic. Okay, um, Gabriela, go ahead and give us just the chief concern for um, Valeria and Gabrielle to discuss. Okay, so the chief concern is diplop diplopia. Diplopia, fantastic. Okay, um, Gabriela, since I think it's your first time discussing at a neuro VMR, tell us what comes to mind when you hear diplopia. How do you start thinking through um, this case? So actually, when discussing about diplopia, the first thing that came to that come to my mind is a, a stratified diplopia into three categories: binocular and monocular. Uh, usually in binocular, the diplopia disappears when one eye is closed. Um, so for example, thinking about uh, some weakness problem of the extraocular muscles, we could think if it's something acute in some vascular problems such as strokes, or uh, if it's some subacute, chronic, progressive, or recurrent such as myasthenia gravis, or for example, if the patient have others, uh, has other symptoms of hyperthyroidism, we could think about thyroid uh, disease. Um, in the case of monocular categories, thinking about the uh, eye itself problems, such as refractory um, misalignments, I, I think that's called. Um, yeah, I think that, that's it. Fantastic, um, Gabrielle, this is great. So diplopia is double vision, right? And we can all have the experience of double vision if you gently, not too hard, just push on one eyelid and then look to the other side. Your eyes have to be perfectly aligned um, so that the image is falling on the same part of the retina and your brain can see things uh, as aligned. And so um, any disruption in the alignment of the eyes will cause diplopia that as Gabrielle said is binocular meaning it's because the two eyes are not aligned. And so if the alignment is the problem and you just cover one eye, either eye, then the diplopia should go away. That tells you you have an eye alignment uh, problem. Monocular diplopia, I think is sort of a funny way of describing things because how can you see double out of one eye, but that's usually a problem with the, the lens um, such that the, the, the image is distorted and the patient may see double tr vision, triple vision, or just something if you put on glasses that are scratched or something or that are foggy, can look like the image is, is unclear or blurred. Um, so um, that's something where if you cover that eye, everything will look fine from the other eye, but you cover the other eye and everything will look um, uh, abnormal out of that eye. Great. Um, so um, you mentioned a very important cause. So we started talking about, about how vision about neurologic differential diagnosis in terms of the localization and the time course. He started to tell us um, some of that, and that requires understanding how the eyes move and how that movement is controlled by the nervous system. Um, and then he started telling us a little bit about the time course. Is this sudden and onset? Could there be a vascular uh, lesion somewhere affecting one of the, um, well, we, we won't get into that yet, a vascular lesion, right? Affecting the eye movement um, pathways. And you mentioned another very important etiology, which is thyroid eye disease, which can affect the extraocular muscles, one possible localization, and the patient may have actually no other signs of hyper 
thyroidism and may present just with uh, diplopia. I believe the inferior rectus is the most commonly affected eye muscle in thyroid eye disease, but someone can check me on that, but it's usually the rectus muscles and I think inferior rectus. And so it's a little bit complicated. Usually in neurology, we're thinking, well, the weak muscle is going to define the problem uh, of gaze. But in thyroid eye disease, the muscle is inflamed and it's actually restricting movement. So if the inferior rectus is pulling the eye down, the eye will have trouble looking up because it's restricted by that um, uh, other, other movement. So, um, so great. So I was just highlighting some of uh, Gabrielle's excellent points. There's lots more to say, but I'll let you um, talk a little bit, Valeria, and then I can fill in um, whatever we haven't discussed about uh, the approach to diplopia. Yes, well, I really don't have much to add about uh, what Will said. I think um, just to put it in localization approach that Aaron always um, reminds us, kind of starting or understanding diplopia as a misalignment of the eyes. And so starting with uh, etiologies that are usually monocular, like refractory errors or something affecting the retina that could explain um, the diplopia, and then going back and thinking about uh, the vascularity, like I already mentioned in a stroke or the muscles themselves um, in the um, orbital cavity, like uh, entire disease, anemia gravis. And then maybe where is the eye thinking about uh, something like uh, maybe a fracture or a cellulitis affecting the orbit. And well, going back all the way to the, to the brainstem, thinking about the vascularity there of the cranial nerves that, uh, um, kind of make the movement of the eyes, but also the, the vision itself. And so, um, yeah, that's what kind of what I was thinking going from the eye to, to the rainstem. Fantastic. And I'm glad you brought up in terms of etiologies, myasthenia gravis. Um, that can really imitate any extraocular movement um, palsy, some of which I'm sure we'll, we'll talk about. Usually fatigability is the main um, feature. The patients may say their double vision is worse at the end of the, at the, end of the day. Um, and you'd like to see ptosis with that, but you don't always see it. It can just be one or more weak extraocular muscles that are fatigable and the patient has double vision and they look like they have a palsy of a muscle or cranial nerve and they actually have neuromuscular junction etiology. So um, let's talk a little bit about this pathway because it's an interesting um, pathway and allows us to sort of <clears throat> formalize a little bit the, the localization uh, aspect. Now normally, and I don't think we've talked about diplopia and the in uh, VMR yet, so so um, this will be fun, I hope. <laughs> so normally when we, we have so many cases of weakness, right? And I always say, well, let's start at the top in the brain and work our way down to the muscle. Actually, when I teach the eye movements and think about them, I think it's actually more logical to start um, from the eye, from the most distal um, part, and then see what sort of the boss of each, each part, right? We all know that med student is supervised by the intern, is supervised by the resident, the chief resident, the attending, the division chief, the department chair, the provost, all that stuff. And I always think that eye movements, you sort of think of it in who's, who's in charge of what. So the eyes themselves, um, I believe, someone can correct me if I'm wrong, that the movements of the eyes are actually the fastest movements in the body and that the eyeballs can move at about 700 degrees per second, which would mean like in the cartoons when someone wins the lottery and the eyeballs did this, right? That you could actually move your eyes if you could move them all the way around you could do two rotations in, in, a, in a second. And that's impressive speed, right? But that speed has to be perfectly coordinated between the eyes or we'll get um, double vision. So how does this work? Well, we have six muscles controlling each eye, right? Four rectus and two oblique, superior, inferior, medial, lateral rectus, superior and inferior oblique. The rectus actions are really easy to understand, right? Superior up, inferior down, lateral rectus, abduction, abduction towards the ear, and medial rectus adduction towards the nose, medial adduction, adduction, right? The oblique muscles are a little more complicated to understand the superior oblique in towards the eye and brings it down in the adducted position and the inferior oblique is the opposite. We won't get into that unless this patient has a superior oblique palsy because it's complicated and would take a long time to explain. So we have those six muscles in each eye and then those six muscles are controlled by cranial nerves, right? Which which cranial nerves, um, Valeria and Gabrielle, control these six extraocular muscles? The three, the four, and the six. Perfect. Yes. And do you know which muscles are controlled by which nerve? You can do the ones that are the simplest first is usually the way I remember it. Um, well, I think the six is the lateral rectus and the four is the superior 
oblique. Perfect. I, I know the, the name in Spanish, Oblico Superior. I don't yeah, know how you to got say it. And the rest is three. You said it perfectly in English, and thank you for teaching us how to say it also in, in Spanish. Yeah, the rest is three, right? Six is an easy cranial nerve, does one thing, abduction through the lateral rectus. Four does the superior oblique, which actually has a complicated action, which we'll get into if it becomes relevant. And three does everything else, plus the levator palpebrae, plus parasympathetic to the pupil, right? So we have muscles, and then we have nerves at three, four, six on each side. And as Valeria told us, those nerves come from the brainstem. Remember midbrain, one, two, three, four, pons, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12 for the medulla, basically a few exceptions. So three and four are in the midbrain, six is in the pons. Now is when things start uh, getting interesting, right? Because if I wanna look to the left, I need to activate, how am I gonna look to the left, Valeria or Gabrielle? Um, which muscle and which nerve on, on each side? If I want to look to my left. So I think the coordination of both eyes will probably need the oculomotor and the abducens as well to, so that the eye that is looking to the left uh, will probably be uh, oculomotor and then the abducens will, I think this is the, will be also to the, to the middle of the eye field and um, yeah, so I like when I'm doing eye movements to just put my two hands up. I saw one of my attendings in uh, medical school doing this, a neuro-ophthalmologist saying, okay, so if you have this, is going this way and this is going this way, right? So if I'm looking to the left, Valeria told me, I need to abduct my left eye, that's lateral rectus cranial nerve six, and I need to adduct my right eye, that's medial rectus cranial nerve three. So how does my left six nucleus in the pons and right three nucleus in the midbrain talk to each other so that that movement is conjugate? How does that work? Does anyone, anyone know? Yes, there is this uh, nuclei in the brainstem that connects both. I don't remember the name exactly, but there's how you call uh, an ophthalmoplegia, I believe. That, yes, that it's Do you remember? I see Maria who's studying for step one, actively shaking her head. This is the step one's favorite neurology question on every board exam. Would anyone remember the name of that pathway, Gabriella, Gabrielle or Valeria? You told me what the lesion is called, internuclear ophthalmoplegia, right? Because you have a problem between the nuclei. This pathway is called, you can tell me in Spanish. I'm sure it will be similar. Maria, I know, is itching to say it if Gabrielle doesn't want uh, Medial longitudinal fasciculus. Medial longitudinal fasciculus, not to be confused with the medial lemniscus, which is for the somatosensory pathway dorsal column, right? So this fiber pathway, the most myelinated pathway in the body, that's why it's uh, affected so commonly in multiple sclerosis because it needs to go so fast to make sure your eyes are moving quickly together. So um, cranial nerve six on one side communicates with cranial nerve three on the other side through this MLF, right? But we're not done. What even tells the eyes to move left? There's something in the pons called the paramedian pontine reticular formation or PPRF. One on the left for left gaze, one on the right for right gaze. The left one says, hey, cranial nerve six nucleus, do your thing. And cranial nerve six says, I'm telling my left eye to go left and then through the MLF, right eye to go left. But the brainstem doesn't get to control our actions, right? The brain does. So we have to go even one more boss of that, right? So the muscles are bossed around by the nerves. Nerves are controlled by the nuclei. Nuclei are controlled by the PPRF and that is controlled by the FEF, the frontal eye field. And here's where we have our crossing, right? So if I wanna look to the left, remember the right brain controls my left arm, sees my left visual field. So it makes sense that the right brain will send my eyes over to the left. And we see in patients with stroke of the right hemisphere, I think we had a case like this one time, right? Patients will be looking over to the right side away from their weakness and towards their deficit. So now taking it from the top, if I wanna look left, my right frontal eye field fires, crosses over to my left PPRF that tells my left six nerve nucleus to activate my left cranial nerve six, lateral rectus, left eye AB ducts, and simultaneously that left six nerve nucleus sends a signal over to the right cranial nerve three nucleus in the midbrain to the medial rectus so I can look left. Why did we spend 20 minutes on that? Because this is our framework, right? We need to figure out now, do we have where our problem is? And if we have diplopia, the eyes are misaligned. It can't be the FEF because that is a conjugate gaze center. And it can't be the PPRF because that's a conjugate gaze center. When those are affected, the eyes are deviated to one side together conjugately. So to have diplopia, either we need a problem in the MLF, 
so that when I'm trying to look left, the signal never gets to my right eye, right? And so one eye AB ducks and the other eye is static. Or I have a problem in one or more cranial nerve nuclei, or I have a problem in one or more cranial nerves, or I have a problem in one or more extraocular muscles, or I have a problem at the neuromuscular junction. So we're MLF and below if we have double vision, right? And then each of these things is gonna have a different differential diagnosis. So before we even know the time course, right? What can happen in the brainstem? Anything that can happen in the brain, right? Demyelinating plaque, stroke, tumor, et cetera. What can happen to the cranial nerves? All sorts of different things, right? What can happen to the extraocular muscles and what can happen to the neuromuscular junction, myasthenia. So this is our landscape, right? This is our map that as we hear the history and do the exam and figure out well, which eye and which movement, and we're gonna be able to localize this. And once we're localized and we know the time course, we should be close to our diagnosis. Okay, eye movements made simple, hopefully. Okay, um, all right, Gabriella, thank you for that one word to trigger the first half hour of our discussion. Let's hear the HPI um, for this patient and then we'll, uh, we'll discuss. Yeah, amazing discussion as always. So uh, it's a 75 year old female that presents with acute diplopia that presented suddenly two days ago. Uh, her son noted that her eyes were misaligned that day. The diplopia is binocular, horizontal, and gets worse when she looks to the right. She denies any other symptoms associated such as dysphagia, dysarthria, eye pain, red eye, fever, headache, fatigability, or any other symptoms. Uh, in the P, uh, previous medical history, she has a 20-year uh, history of diabetes, hypertension, heart failure, and uh, anemia due to B12 deficiency that started to be treated five months ago. She had breast cancer 10, 10 years ago and gastroesophageal reflux disease. Uh, about medication, she, she uses insulin, empagliflozin, metanolol, furosemid, metformin, B12, and omeprazole. She denies allergies, smoking, or ethanol use, and the family history is non-controversial. Fantastic. Thank you, Gabby. So those of you new to Morning Report that thought, isn't this only an hour and they spent a half hour on the cheap um, concern, I always, as you know, take a a gamble that once we get further along, um, uh, things will things will uh, clarify and be shorter discussions. Though I often miscalculate on <laughs> um, Okay, you spoke um, first, Gabrielle, last time. We'll let the other um, birthday participant, uh, Valeria, tell us this time uh, what your what your birthday wishes are for this HPI. Yeah, so um, I think the fact that the patient noted, well, the degree is binocular, so I'm thinking more of something. And the uh, course or the time course is quite acute, but not hyperacute. So I wouldn't rule out the possibility of a vascular etiology, maybe something inflammatory. Um, and then the possibility of something metabolic because the patient has a past medical history of diabetes. I don't know if, I don't think, um, a palsy of the columnar nerve from diabetes could cause that the eyes are misaligned. I don't understand exactly what the, that means if the pupil is looking at the other side or if there's a ptosis or, um, and so if there is ptosis, for example, that could be a possibility um, from the sympathetic nerves being affected and uh, well, because of the long history of diabetes. And then I think, um, well, a possibility of a stroke because the diplopia is binocular. Uh, maybe uh, see also the pupil on the exam, see how it is to think maybe of sympathetic compromise as well. And other possibilities such as myasthenia gravis, if, there, if there's fatigability, it's also an important, I think, uh, cause of diplopia of the binocular category. Brilliant, thank you, Valeria. Right, so this is, um... Gabby used the word acute, but um, the, the patient's uh, telling us that it was sudden two days ago, right? So sometimes people say, well, this has been going on for three months. And then you say, well, how did it start suddenly, right? So it was hyperacute, right? Sudden, but, um, but uh, some time ago, right? So as you said, that would make us think of a vascular etiology. And you gave us two interesting possibilities for vascular etiologies, which is 
um, brilliant. One is that there's a vascular, um, there's a stroke somewhere in the pathways we've discussed, right? Um, and the other is that she had a diabetic um, uh, ocular, motor, ocular motor nerve palsy, ocular motor meaning three, four, or six, oculo motor meaning just three, right? But an ocular motor um, palsy from diabetes, which is believed to be probably a micro infarct um, of the nerve uh, itself. Uh, one of the cranial nerves, three, four, or six, fantastic. Um, so those are certainly possibilities. Myasthenia, I agree with you, is always on the table for diplopia because um, one of my uh, mentors like to say, diplopia is always sudden because there's a point at which it's there <laughs> and before it was not, right? You don't sort of gradually become diplopic. Your diplopia could become worse, but even if it's come on chronically, you're probably compensating and doing other things, um, squinting and doing other things, right? To, to try to avoid it. So there was a moment where it wasn't there and a moment where it is, right? You hit a sort of threshold, even if the process has been going on. So um, this could be myasthenia and the patient is just um, noticing the uh, diplopia more certainly uh, a possibility. Um, great. Um, other thoughts, Gabrielle? Yeah, I actually don't have too much to add. I think uh, the past medical history is also suggestive for um, hyperlipidemia problems. So uh, that uh, may may made me think in vascular etiology is on the top of my list, but also, as you said, our own this could be a um, senior gravis too. And uh, I, I, I'm, I think that maybe the, the fact that the patient have a worsening when she looks to the right and like a horizontal diplopia, I think that could also make us thinking uh, in median longitudinal fascicular problems, uh, I, I don't actually know, don't know. Yeah, great, great thoughts, um, both of you. So a couple of questions to guide us here. One is the question you just started to answer, Gabrielle. What are the possibilities if the patient is having worsening diplopia than they when they look to the right? In other words, what are the possible, presuming this is a problem with just one, muscle, let's start there, right? It could be multiple, but, um, or one action, let's not say muscle yet and say the localization, one action. What problems when we look to the right, sorry, my example before, teaching example is looking to the left, but now we get to review looking to the right. What could be the problems um, that would cause the diplopia to worsen when we look to the right? In other words, we're supposed to be doing this, right? What could be one or one of the problems that makes the eyes misaligned when we're supposed to be looking to the right? What do you think, Valeria or Gabrielle? Um, could maybe me maybe be uh, also an internal nuclear appreciate because the patient will be looking at the right and the other eye couldn't move because there's no communication and so that doesn't will not move. Perfect. So one possibility would be an internuclear ophthalmoplegia, medial longitudinal fasciculus localization. And Valeria, you described it perfectly. The patient would try to look to the right, the right eye would AB duct, and the left eye would stay at the midline or would not fully AD duct, right? And usually there is nystagmus in the abducting eye. It's like that eye is saying, come on, come on, come on, other eye, come with me. Um, so that is a possibility. And that medial longitudinal fasciculus that we learn it in medical school and for step one, that it just connects six and three on one side and six and three on the other side. It's actually a highway connecting three, four, six, and eight um, for the uh, control of the vestibulo ocular reflex. So it's sort of a highway with exits for eight, for six, for four, uh, for three. And so, um, so, um, so right, so, so one possibility is, and, and so that runs from the medulla to the midbrain is the reason I was wondering, why am I making that point? Runs from the medulla to the midbrain. But if you're just getting the part that communicates between six and three, you could have a lesion in the pons uh, or in the midbrain. So one possibility, as Gabby said, is a small lesion there. And since this was, I'm sorry, as Valeria said, was a lesion in the MLF. Um, and you might say, is it the right MLF or the left MLF? The MLF nomenclature is confusing because it crosses right away. It, the six fibers going over to three, they pretty much cross right away. So it spends most of its time on the side of the destination three. So this would technically be a 
Um, if the patient's having trouble looking to the right because the left eye is not adducting, it would be a left INO, but there's saying INO is good enough <laughs> because it tells you where the problem is. It's in the dorsal brainstem. Okay, so one possibility is an INO because the right eye is, or the left eye is not adducting when we're trying to look to the right. Um, Gabrielle, you were going to say something? No, I, I actually wanted to suggest also internuclear ophthalmoplegia. Yeah, I think the, um, the USMLE does some things to our minds, right? It makes us think that INO is the most common cause of diplopia and NPH is the normal pressure hydrocephalus is the most common cause of a gait disorder, neither of which are uh, entirely true, um, but um, uh, certainly possible. What else? So what else could prevent the eyes from looking um, to the right uh, conjugately? So one, eye, one possibility you both mentioned is that the left eye can't adduct from an INO. Is there another possibility through which the left eye might not adduct or maybe a problem with the this, right eye? Yeah. This could be a problem in the six cranial nerve of the right. So the patient couldn't look to the right. Uh, yeah, I, th I think that that's it because if it could be a problem in the third cranial nerve on the left, I think other a ex other eye movements of the left eye could be affected, but in this case, it's like horizontal to the right. Perfect. So basically, the two broad possibilities: if I can't look conjugately to the right, if I if I can't look at all to the right, then we could be talking about FEFs and PPRFs and all that stuff. But if I have diplopia on right gaze, either my right eye is not adequately abducting, or my left eye is not adequately adducting. Now, the right eye, simple, right? How does it abduct? lateral rectus, cranial nerve six. So we could have a right lateral rectus problem or cranial nerve six problem, right? On the left side, maybe we're not adducting, which could be a problem with the medial rectus, could be a problem with the third cranial nerve, or could be a problem with the MLF, right? And as you said, could it be the third cranial nerve? Well, then why is only one movement affected? Now, maybe when we examine the patient, we'll see that actually other movements are affected and this is the most notable one, but that does so many functions. The pupil, as Valeria told us, should be abnormal, although not always. You might have ptosis, although not always. The third nerve does so many things, um, but you can get a partial third nerve palsy, but most of the time getting just the fibers to the medial rectus would be um, pretty unlikely, right? So we're talking about a left six, I'm sorry, a right six, <laughs> A right lateral rectus problem, a left medial rectus problem, a left third nerve palsy, unlikely unless we see lots of other stuff on the exam, um, or an INO. And as you said, this is sudden. So if it's a um, if it's a problem in the medial longitudinal fasciculus, we'd be thinking about a stroke. And if it's a problem in the right cranial nerve six, or less likely a partial left cranial nerve three, we could be thinking about um, a diabetic uh, infarct or a diabetic ocular motor palsy, diabetic infarct of one of those cranial nerves. And then as we said, since it's hard to say, <laughs> call diplopia anything but sudden because it was not there and then it was, um, myasthenia is still possible, is thyroid eye disease um, still possible with a restricted movement? Probably um, still possible, right? But the suddenness makes us really think vascular here as both um, and we said, fantastic. Okay, so we're really interested in this patient's eye movements on exam. And of course, we're also interested in if we pick up any other neurologic uh, deficits along the way that would say, oh, whoa, 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 this patient is complaining of diplopia, but actually has a pronator drift or asymmetric reflexes, and we need to um, revise our uh, differential, or we're just still in pathways uh, from brainstem to the eyes. Okay, Gabriella, what did you find uh, on the exam? Okay, so in the exam, um, patient wasn't able to abduct the right eye. She had uh, horizontal diplopia that got worse when she looked to the right. Uh, no ptosis or fatigability, no other cranial nerve abnormalities. She also had a diminished vibration in the inferior limbs, in the toes and tibial tuberosity bilaterally and symmet symmetrically. Uh, she had a, an Achilles reflex, one out of four, and the rest of the reflexes, two out of four. And the remaining of the neuro exam was normal. 
great. We know Gabriella is a neurologist uh, because she didn't even tell us the systemic exam is normal, the vital signs, which I appreciate. <laughs> we always know when our wonderful internist colleagues are presenting us um, cases, they first tell us all of the systemic exam and vitals, even if they're normal and neurologists like to just presume if you didn't tell me, it's fine. Right. Great. I love it. Um, yeah, they were normal. <laughs> I know. I'm just, uh, I'm just being funny since we, um, since we, uh, that's how neurologists communicate, right? If you didn't tell me about the sodium, I'm going to presume it's normal. Let's talk about the scan. Okay, great. Um, all right. So this is bread and butter in neurology, right? You examine the patient and you get your answer. Um, so what uh, is going on here? I forget who's up first. So either of you, um, feel free to, uh, to let us know what you're interpreting. Uh, on uh, this I wanted to clarify the reflexes. Sure. Yeah. Gavi, could you repeat those? Sure. Uh, it was one out of four in the in the acute reflexes, and in the rest of the reflexes, she had two out of four. Okay. Thank you. So, what are we thinking here? Um. Okay, so as we were discussing before, we could have either a lesion of the sixth cranial nerve of the right or a partial lesion of the third cranial nerve on the left or on the left longitudinal of the medial longitudinal fascicle. But a linking that with all these uh, other neurologic symptoms, especially the sensory and the hyperreflexia of the Achilles, I think this could make us think localizing the problem to the brainstem. Um, I'm not so sure yet, but um, maybe this is where also the um, the problem is uh, started, and I think this could be explained by a stroke because the of the course of the disease. Um, but yeah, I, I was. I was thinking that also it seems like weird for me to um, just a hyperreflexia on the Achilles reflexes, but no on um, no, no, all the other reflexes. Yeah. Okay. So you were thinking about the brainstem here, Gabriel. Tell me why you were thinking about the brainstem. Mm -hmm. So in the brainstem, we have. Um, the motor, the sensory, the sympathetic, and also the cranial nerves like get close together. So it's uh, easier to get a lesion there and affecting uh, lots of neurologic uh, functions. So I was thinking in that, especially I think if we are thinking in six cranial nerve, we were trying to localize to the I think they could be the bones, um, but yeah, yeah. I see, I see. So you're, um, let's talk about the eye part first, right? So the right eye can't abduct, and you just told us based on the, the formula. So we were saying before, right? We decided the problem is in the right eye. So I and O, that was fun to discuss. And partial third nerve palsy on the left, that was fun to discuss, but now we know. We have a problem in the right eye with abduction. Either there's a problem in the lateral rectus or problem in the sixth cranial nerve. And so you're right, we have to think about that pathway from the sixth cranial nerve from the pons as a very tortuous intracranial course. That's why we've talked about before with elevated intracranial pressure, you can get a six nerve palsy, which we call a false localizing sign because it's not a focal finding. It's just because the pressure is high and that nerve is very long and tortuous. And so it can be affected there. So it could be anywhere from the pons to the orbit. Um, so um, you were thinking it was the pons because you're trying to integrate these uh, deficits in vibration and reflexes. Is that right? Yeah, if you were trying to make okay. one lesion. I see where you're coming from. Um, let me pause there for a second. Valeria, what were you thinking here? And then I'll, I'll try to um, reconcile some of these findings. Yeah, so I think I, I saw the eye findings and the uh, findings on the reflexes and sensory exam as two different things. I think uh, they're joined together by the factors or the risk factors that the patient has. And so I'm thinking about uh, an stroke as well for the eye findings, something affecting the bones. But then I don't think 
um, the same uh, finding or the same possibility hypothesis um, explains the reflexes and the sensory because I would expect a more um, diffuse distribution. But, and I think um, the fact that the patient has diabetes could point us to a neuropathy that is affecting uh, the peripheral uh, limbs, which is usually the, the pattern that diabetes has. And so uh, maybe asking, well, I don't think uh, if they, they have been some from another um, sensory problems, maybe some tingling, how long ago, what is the last time he, uh, she sorry, um, controlled her diabetes, if she's uh, regular on her insulin. And, and then I think the, the fact that the patient cannot abduct her eye makes us think of something affecting the abduction nerve. And so the possibility of an stroke at the pons, I think, is on top of my differential. Great thought. So, um, Gabrielle, I agree with your starting approach is we always try to see if we can find one lesion somewhere in the nervous system that can explain everything. Um, but sometimes there's two lesions, right? People say there's Occam's razor, and then maybe you've heard one of my um, professors like to say, and then there's Hickam dictum, that a person can have as many diseases as they darn well pleases, right? Which is the opposite, that they can have multiple problems, right? Instead of one parsimonious explanation for everything. So I think if we took out the eye problem, right? And I just told you this is a patient with diminished reflexes in the most distal reflex and symmetric distal sensory loss, probably you would say it's a neuropathy, right? But having the eye movement there where you were trying um, very um, valiantly to, to, to put these things um, together. And as Valeria said, they are put together, right? But by a common risk factor rather probably than a common lesion. Because if you had um, bilateral sensory findings from a brainstem lesion, probably you're going to have a lot more stuff going on um, there. Um, and yet Valeria still thought we were in the brainstem. She said we have a lesion of the six, um, uh, somewhere along the six pathway, and the other stuff is diabetic neuropathy. We have length-dependent sensory loss, distal uh, reflex loss. That sounds like a neuropathy that in this patient is probably diabetic and or from B12 deficiency, although we've heard that's treated. But if she's not absorbing it from her proton pump inhibitor, she could be B12 deficient also. Um, okay. Um, so I'm going to agree with you, Valeria, that those things are separate, but I'm going to disagree that the lesion is in the pons. Before I tell you um, why, um, any thoughts on why I'm going to disagree with the lesion in the pons? And if so, where, where is it? And I think this will help um, us clarify an area of neuroanatomy that I think can get confusing for, for some people. Why, am I, why might I um, not agree with both of you for the brain stem? Maybe because the cranial nerve 6 is medial uh, because it is, uh, uh, I don't know what to say, but like a multiple of 12. <laughs> I just remembered it by that. And, um, and it is just in the middle of the pons and the, um, I don't remember the name of the, the structure as well, but the, I don't know how to say it, like the tronco, it is in in Spanish. Yeah. Uh, so maybe because of that, maybe we'll be thinking lower or no. Oh, I think six was the exception of the rule of the four kernel nerve, so then I'm lost, <laughs> I don't know. No problem. No, this is a very, very subtle anatomical point. Any thoughts? Um, Gabrielle, you're on the right track, Valeria, um, of thinking of where this is in the brainstem. And the clue is the brainstem is really small, right? And there's lots of stuff in there, right? So as um, I was saying in response to Gabrielle's hypothesis, if we had the six nerve nucleus and the sensory pathways, um, on both sides, right? That means a pretty big brainstem lesion and probably the patient could be weak and might have other cranial neuropathies and, and, and depending on where we are in the brainstem might not even be awake to tell us about this, right? So you'd need the world's tiniest lesion to get that, um, uh, just the six nerve nucleus. So we have to think about what, I, what, what we call neighborhood signs, right? So what else is near the six nerve nucleus that if it were affected in the brainstem would almost certainly be affected as well. This is a very subtle anatomical point. Any thoughts? It has to do with this rule of four as Valeria are on the right track here. Yeah, Any so thoughts? I'm thinking maybe a motor compromise as well because of the IMS. So, so 
That's one possibility, right? The sixth nerve comes out the medial brainstem and passes right near the corticospinal tract. So you can get one of these crossed sign symptoms that the step loves, right? USMLE loves, but not that common in real life where you have a six nerve palsy on one side and a hemiplegia or hemiparesis on the other side of the arm and leg from the six on the way out and the not yet crossed corticospinal tract. That's one possibility. What if we just had a dorsal brainstem uh, lesion? So the six nerve, you, you were gonna say? Seven. Seven, okay. you would have seven, excellent. So the six nerve nucleus is medial, as Valeria said, it's one of the motor nuclei, three, four, six, 12, the most medial nuclei. The next nuclei slightly more laterally out are the bronchial motor nuclei, which are motor, but are not pure skeletal muscle motor. And that's um, motor five for the muscles of mastication, seven for the face, and then nine and 10 for the larynx and pharynx. So sort of the next, still pretty medial, but slightly lateral to our three, four, six, 12. And then the sensory and special sensory five and eight are the most lateral. And the six nerve nucleus, when the, what's called the fascicle, which is the sixth nerve before it leaves the brainstem, it comes out and actually loops around the seventh nerve nucleus before coming forward to come out. Why it does that, I have no idea, but it makes this like on a violin, you know, that sort of squiggle thing where the sound comes out, it makes this little loop around the seventh nerve nucleus. So when we see a six nerve palsy and there's no facial weakness on that side, we almost certainly cannot be in the brain stem because they're right next to each other. And to get a pin size lesion just in the six nerve nucleus, um, almost impossible. You'd almost certainly get the seven next to it. So if you have six and seven together, that's a package that tells you, hey, I'm in the dorsal pons. And if you have six and seven on one side and a hemiplegia on the other side, that's one of the named brainstem syndromes. Is it Millard, Gubler? One of these, they all have names. It's not Wallenberg, that's lateral medullary. They all have names. I think it's Millard, Gubler. These all have names from when French people were just putting their names on every brainstem syndrome back when that was the thing to do. Um, so, so I don't think this can be in the brainstem. So we're in the six outside the brainstem and then where can it be? The subarachnoid space, right? And if we had lots of cranial nerves, we'd say, oh, maybe we have a meningeal process, right? Could it be in the cavernous sinus? Well, three, four, V1, V2, they're all in there just to get six. It does kind of hang out a little bit um, off the wall where the other cranial nerves are, but hard to imagine, right? Um, or in the orbit, but then we get all kinds of problems, right? So it's probably just something affecting cranial nerve six without affecting the meninges hanging out in the subarachnoid space, which would make us go back to your original hypothesis of our birthday discussants, right? That this is a diabetic sixth. Um, which is presumed to be a micro infarct uh, of the nerve from uncontrolled diabetes. So a sudden onset stroke, but a stroke of the cranial nerve rather than of the brain. That seems to me to be the most likely thing here. Although could this patient have diabetes causing her neuropathy and now also has myasthenia or also has thyroid eye disease? I guess that's possible, but we didn't hear about fatigability. Um, we didn't hear about restriction. So if the patient had a thyroid eye disease problem of the right medial rectus. So their eye was tightly held and couldn't AB duct. You could actually try to see if you can move the globe passively through the lid and see if it's, it's getting stuck. We didn't hear about that. So probably this is the sixth nerve, not the nucleus in the brainstem, not the fascicle in the brainstem or we'd have neighborhood signs, not the cavernous sinus, not the orbit, just the sixth nerve hanging out somewhere that got infarcted would be my best guess. And if that's correct, then if you feel you're pretty sure about that on the exam, you could even say, we don't even need to do neuroimaging in this patient, right? We could just say, it's a diabetic palsy, put a patch over the eye and it'll get better in a few months. And if another cranial nerve palsy pops up, we reevaluate, we rescan. Or if the patient has made their way through the emergency room, it's an acute neurologic problem, often will get a scan and it should be normal. That six nerve is really tiny. You can barely see it on MRI and you're not gonna see a, a stroke in the nerve. So um, that's my hypothesis. You were both so, so close. You got the six. Um, you got that it was somewhere along six. And I think people often um, think of the cranial nerves and the brainstem so tightly together as a package when they learn it that people forget that the cranial nerves have their course, right, to get to their target. And they can be affected along that course by a process affecting the meninges, like meningitis, like leptomeningeal uh, cancer, like subarachnoid hemorrhage, or just a problem affecting one or more individual nerves like uh, Guillain-Barre syndrome or something like that. Um, uh, or is Gabby gonna tell us that then a few days later, 
she had trouble moving the left eye and then the reflexes kept getting even worse and she got ataxic and she has Miller-Fisher syndrome. <laughs> Maybe this is the first thing happening uh, to one cranial nerve and other things are about to happen. So um, what happened next, uh, Gabby? Okay, so uh, I have some uh, labs here. Uh, the HbA1c was 8.8. .8. Uh, serologies, HIV and syphilis were, and hepatitis were negative. Electrolytes were normal. Um, and I have the brain MRI that showed no ischemic lesion on diffusion and any other and abnormalities. And so, um, yeah. You and so, with us? <laughs> <laughs> sorry, can you repeat? I said, oh, so did you and your team agree with our hypothesis since you don't have any more information at this stage than, than we do? Yeah, yeah. So the final diagnosis was uh, isolated cranial nerve 6 palsy. And as I was studying it, so the main causes of isolated cranial nerve, the main cause is microvascular, which is probably due to hypertension and diabetes. And there's a lot of cases that are actually idiopathic. So this is always a, key, a possibility, I think. And in other patients, uh, I read one article saying that we should order uh, CPR and e uh, e uh, sedimentation rate to rule out uh, giant cell arthritis. But I don't have the results of this finding, but she doesn't have headache or any other eye finding, uh, loss of vision, etc. But I still have to, I'm waiting for these results. And regarding the exam that you were trying to uh, put all everything together, uh, our understanding was that she has she also has a neuropathy, and she has two cases for it, two causes for it: uh, the B12 deficiency and the diabetes. But we are still investigating other possible cases. Causes, Fantastic. I think. I mean. <laughs> Yeah, so my understanding that um, although this is microvascular, that for whatever reason, diabetes is the main risk factor. Correct me if you've seen otherwise in the literature that you could get it from hypertension without diabetes. I haven't heard that, though it may be um, the case as well. But I think of it as a diabetic complication of diabetes. Six may be the most common. I'm sure someone has done a series. In my experience, it's the most um, common, but you could get four and you could get three. People say that Bell's palsy is more common in diabetics. Is that also a nerve infarct? Um, uh, I'm not sure that's clear. A lot of people think it's HSV uh, reactivation. Um, so I agree with you. This sounds like a diabetic nerve palsy and the prognosis on these is really good. Most patients over a few months, it will just um, get better. And since it is technically a stroke of the nerve, it's a point for patient education, right? To say that this is a sign that you're very much at risk um, for stroke and hopefully um, help this patient um, work uh, with their providers to, to get that A1C um, closer to the normal range and out of this uh, risk window. Um, since rare rare event that we're entering the discussion in time for the teaching points, one other quick thing that's just interesting since we're talking about very nuanced cranial nerve anatomy. So the diabetic six nerve in park, at least in my experience, is the most common. You can get a fourth or third nerve palsy. Now the third nerve palsy, you'd say, well, the eye should be down and out, right from the unopposed lateral rectus and uh, superior oblique, and the pupil should be large and the lid should be low. But it turns out that a diabetic infarct, a microvascular third, actually the pupil stays normal. You just get the rest of the findings. The eye is down and out, but the pupil is normal. Does anyone know why that is? It's a very beautiful anatomical explanation. Well, because of the distribution of the sympathetic nerves, oh, sympathetic fibers, there are, um, so we would have like uh, two possibilities if there is a aneurysm that is compressing the exterior. And I believe that in that case, the pupil will be dilated. But if there's like an infarct that usually affects the center of the nerve, the, the fibers will not be affected, so the pupil will be. Perfect. So not only could we localize something to the third nerve, we can localize it to part of the third nerve. And Valeria said that perfectly. The pupillomotor fibers, which are parasympathetic, right? They shrink the, the pupil, they constrict the pupil. Those are on the external and medial portion of the nerve. So all those, you say, well, the third nerve does so many things. Each of those has its own subnucleus in the midbrain. Believe it or not, the superior rectus subnucleus crosses, just wild neuroanatomy. 
and the nerve is laminated with those fibers running straight to their targets. And for whatever reason, the pupillary fibers are external and medial. So if you have an aneurysm or you have uncle herniation of the temporal lobe, you can blow the pupil, but the eye movements are still normal. And that is a very ominous finding. If you see a blown pupil and the eye movements are still normal or they're becoming abnormal, you're worried about a compressive lesion or the patient has a nebulizer for a pulmonary condition and it's blowing into one eye. That's actually one of the most common consults. Panic, the patient's herniating, the patient's herniating, the neurologist runs into the room and the patient's on the phone and says, why is there a neurologist here? And we, the nebulizer is blowing into one eye and we say, okay, this is not a neurosurgical emergency. <laughs> okay, but if you get a micro infarct, it's the deep part of the nerve where those tiny little vessels are going in that have been damaged by chronic uh, diabetes. And so you actually infarct the middle of the nerve, which is where all the muscle fibers are, and the pupillary fibers on the outside can be spared. So if you see a pupil sparing third nerve palsy, that can be this uh, infarct if it's sudden. And I did see one infiltrative case in a patient with lymphoma, I think it was lymphoma, developed neurolymphomatosis, where the nerve was infiltrated and spared the pupil. Um, so just thought that would be a, a fun point to share. And Valeria already knows it, which is um, phenomenal. Great. Well, thank you for bringing us this case. I don't think we've discussed diplopia, eye movement pathways, and all of the associated um, findings. Gabrielle and Valeria, thank you for celebrating your birthday with a neuro-VMR <laughs> discussion. I love it. Um, and um, Maria, what uh, teaching points have you, have you uh, transcribed for us here? And I saw you continuing to open the box, reduce the font, open the box, reduce the font. Give us your um, your highlights here and um, and then we'll close up. Yeah, I know there were so many uh, teaching points today. Amazing discussion, Vale and Gabriel. And thank you, Gabby, for bringing this amazing case. Um, the plop is very interesting. As you correctly uh, stated at the beginning, you can divide it in monocular and binocular causes. And um, as always, think about localizing features. And for that, you can think about all of the components that are involved in eye movement. So you can think about the muscles, um, which you, we've described. There are three cranial nerves uh, involving all of these muscles, you know, so six. Think about the lateral rectus, four, superior oblique, the third cranial nerve, all of the others, plus the levator pulpiri and parasympathetic fibers to the pupil. Um, after that, think about how the how eyes um, talk to each other. So how do you coordinate movements to the left and to the right? And that involves the medial longitudinal fasciculus. Um, even further than that, we have um, nuclei um, activating the ipsilateral cranial nerve six in the brainstem. And even more, well, even after that, we have the frontal eye field in the, in, in the, in the cortex uh, affecting the contralateral eye movement. And so um, it has to be in a it has to be somewhere along this pathway. So you just have to narrow it to one um, particular area. And for that, you need the collecting clues. So uh, for example, with the worsening diplopia, uh, we had this amazing clue that Gabby gave us from the beginning. So you can think, you know, um, when do we have a worsening diplopia when looking to the right? Uh, think about what's involved when doing right eye movement. So we can think about the right lateral rectus or the cranial nerve six. We can think of the left medial rectus, a cranial nerve three. We can talk about um, how they talk to each other with the MLF. Um, usually uh, the PPRF and the brainstem and frontal eye field will not give you diplopia because those, um, you know, they move both eyes to the right or both eyes to the left. So you can think of them if you don't have movement, but they usually will be coordinated um, both right and left eye. Um, with the brainstem, it's a very busy place. So whenever you, you're thinking about the, the brainstem, think you will have multiple areas affected. And um, Vale alluded to this uh, really cool uh, rule of four. Um, so think about, you know, like the midbrain is going to have cranial nerves three and four, cranial nerve one and two don't really obey these rules. Uh, pons five, seven, six, seven, and eight, medulla nine, 10, 11, and 12. The medial side is going to have all of the numbers that you can like 
easily divide uh, the number 12 with, so 3, 4, 6, and 12, and motor fibers. The lateral is going to have all of the others, so 5, 7, 8, 9, 10, and 11, and sensory fibers. Uh, there are some exceptions. Uh, think of cranial nerve 5 that can involve all of the levels, and cranial nerve, cranial nerve 8 involves the pons and the medulla. And so, you know, think about Hicken's dictum, you know, if the, the patient doesn't read the book and the patient doesn't know what's a brainstem, so they can have as many pathologists as they want. But if you're thinking brainstem, you're usually going to have uh, a lot of defects uh, in the physical exam or in the story. Some awesome cranial nerve six pearls. Uh, if you're thinking about brainstem, also look for cranial nerve, nerve seven palsies. Uh, it has a very long track, so things like uh, intracranial hypertension can affect it, and that's called the false localizing sign. And there's other places that you can get the cranial nerve six palsy, like the meninges, the cavernous sinus, or the orbit, but those are also uh, heavy on cranial nerves. So it's very rare to have isolated cranial nerve six palsy, which was the final diagnosis. And Gabby told us the most common causes um, about is microvascular or idiopathic, but make sure to not miss giant cell arteritis. So look for um, temple, um, tenderness, or order some labs that will indicate inflammation. So, feliz cumpleaños, Alain, Gabriel. I hope you liked it. Muted, muted, sorry. Amazing teaching points, Maria. You, I love the quote, the brainstem is a busy place. I feel like I should have a bumper sticker of that on my, on my car or a sign on my office door. The brainstem is a busy place. I love that. Small, tiny thing, since I know your brainstem anatomy is nearly perfect. 11 does not connect to the brainstem right spinal accessory. So that um, doesn't go there. Um, everything else you said was perfect. Five, all three levels, eight, two sort of goes to the midbrain, right? The afferent limb of the pupillary light reflex that goes to um, the, the pretectal nuclei to Edinger Westfall. So tiny um, things there. And then I didn't comment on the giant cell arteritis, Gabby. Have you found cases reported where they present with diplopia or ocular motor palsy. So giant cell arteritis, I think any older person older than 60 with a new neurologic um, symptom, it's always worth thinking of, especially headache. They often don't have the step one jaw tenderness, uh, scalp tenderness, jaw claudication. Those are very uncommon. Um, and so if I see a new headache in an older person, I always um, look for this new visual problem in an older person. And lesser known is this is an arteritis. That's not just the temporal artery, right? You can actually have strokes uh, from this, from arteritis affecting the cervical vessels. I think more common in the posterior circulation I've read, though. Don't quote me on that. You could probably get the carotids too. Did you find cases, Gabby, of giant cell arteritis causing ocular motor palsies? Uh, actually, I read on a review, but I didn't look for cases. I, I will try to look for them. I'm curious. Because yeah, I'm... I hadn't heard that. I hadn't heard that, but um, mm -hmm. could very well, could very well be. Fantastic. Well, feliz cumpleaños, Gabriel and Valeria. Happy birthday. And thanks for celebrating with us. Hope um, our hope visitors enjoyed the discussion and we'll be excited to discuss next week. And if our colleague who started to present a case earlier um, this time, sorry to, we interrupted you, but hopefully you see our sort of format for presenting uh, a case, which can be more complicated um, than this. Diplopia is complicated. This final diagnosis was straightforward. Can be as complicated as the one you said, just we like to be able to have some um, closure at the, uh, at the end when we can, although we have had cases where, where it's left open, but this shows sort of some of the, the formatting. So thank you so much, everyone. Um, we will see you next Tuesday. Think if you might have a case you'd like to present. If you're not sure or you want some guidance, you can send it to our amazing team neuro, Gabriella, Maria, and um, Valeria, um, and um, they can tell you, um, they can help you sort of guide uh, preparing it to, um, to, to present. And then if you saw how much fun, Gabrielle and Valeria, this is their birthday celebration, right? Even if it's not your birthday, you can celebrate next Tuesday. Have a wonderful day, everyone. Thanks so much. Bye. Thank you. Bye.